Farside Chat is back. This week we talk about some new Flames news, including the announcement of the Adirondack Flames and the appointment of three assistant general managers. Plus, it's part one of three of our draft preview, where we will focus on the Flames' fourth overall pick and will profile five of the top players in this year's draft and who we think the Flames might take. This is Fireside Chat, episode 47, fourth overall, recorded June 7th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's been a while, but this is Dan and Matt back with you talking all about the Flames. How you doing, Matt? Excellent, as always. Since we talked last, you've been quite busy. You've been uh, profiling all of the prospects that the Flames might have a shot at grabbing in the draft based on where their draft picks are this year. And I know those have been very popular. A lot of people have told us they've enjoyed uh, reading those. So thanks for taking the time and writing those. Oh, not a problem. Have you learned it a was lot? Act- yeah, it was quite enjoyable. And especially getting video on each of the players that I was able to profile, it gives the people reading the article an opportunity to also see the player. Because like, if you just get a wall of text and... You can't see the guy. Well, that, you know, you can't make your own conclusions. So, you know, it, it's been fun. So if you haven't read those yet, or if you haven't read them all, they're all on firesidechat.ca, and you can use the search at the top right-hand corner of the page to search for the prospect you're looking for as we talk about them in this episode, in our next episode. Or you can just go there and start reading the newest articles, whatever works. I did about 40 or so articles, so there's quite a bit of content there, so it's all it good. Keeps people gives people something to do until the draft in a couple weeks. Yeah, exactly. And it also helps with any hockey pools or draft pools or whatever to kind of know who you got as potential players, so it's all good. We won't even we won't even take a cut of your draft pool if you win because of Matt's info. Well, Matt, there's been some Flames news since we talked last, so why don't we uh, talk about some Flames news, and then we'll jump right into profiling our first-round players. Sounds like a plan. In the last episode, when we left off, we talked about the uncertainty of the Flames HL franchise. We knew they weren't going to be in Abbotsford next year, but we didn't have official confirmation on where the team would be moving. And now we have confirmation. It's where everyone thought it would be, in Glens Falls, New York. And the team is going to be known as the Adirondack Flames, using the old Atlanta Flames logo with an updated color scheme as their logo. Any thoughts on the move? Oh, I always enjoy when a farm team it really celebrates their team. You know, because that was kind of lacking in Abbotsford for whatever reason. So, you know, and even though Glens Falls is a very small place like i think they only have 15,000 people there they sell out their 5,500 seat arena like every game and they're loud and very hostile so that's always good the other thing i remember listening to an interview with brad Treliving, and i don't remember the exact numbers but something like the team in abbotsford was on the road i think like 70 nights in the year where the Glens Falls team last year was on the road like 19 nights. So if you think about all that travel time, having a team that's closer to the central hub of AHL teams is going to give us a lot more practice time and a lot more, you know, these guys sleeping in their own beds and being more on a routine, which I think is going to be a real benefit. Yeah, and they don't have to undergo that long blizzard road trip like they did earlier in the year. The thing I've heard the most feedback about from Flames fans is the fact the Flames are reusing the old Atlanta Flames logo. What are your thoughts on them doing that? Well, aesthetically, it looks nice. It's a very good logo, and it, you know, they'll look good on the jerseys, but, you know, it is a little lazy, in my opinion, but, you know, I can't complain. It'll look good. I I think it's cool they've updated it with the black um, to match the Flames. I think it's a lot better than the last time they tried to do something like that for a Flames team that was called the Flames in the NHL, which was Quad Cities. I thought that was just awful, the flaming PC. 
And I think it's something that will grow on us. I mean, I kind of like it. I wish that they didn't update it and that they would have used the old Atlanta logo and the throwback Flames jerseys. I think that would have been a real cool nod to Atlanta. Yeah, but, you know, I think the Flames are keeping the black in their rotation, so I don't know as if they're going to be going back to a retro because the Adirondack Flames are... Yeah, but the AHL team can have a completely different logo and uniform. I mean, last year there was silver in the Heat uniform. Yeah, but uh, they were saying that the jersey is going to mirror the Flames logo and jersey, so... The other thing I noticed, and Calgary fans will be envious of this, if you look at the uh, Adirondack Flames website at adirondackflames.com, the season ticket holder prices... If you look at them on that site, the platinum tickets, the you know best seats in the house, eight hundred and ten dollars for the season. Yeah, that's quite a bit less than what I pay for mine, and <laughs> I'm in the greens. So, <laughs> if we had that kind of pricing here, I think everyone would be a season ticket holder. That's about what it costs you to go to two games in the city with parking and beer and everything else. Pretty much. So I, I think it's I think it's a good move. I'm glad to see that they're in a hotbed of hockey. Um, I think that the Abbotsford market didn't work out for them because they're right in the middle of Canucks country, plus they were so far away from every other team. But we're in an established market. This is a market that's had a team forever. They're, they just finished having the Philadelphia uh, farm team, the Philadelphia Phantom, or the Adirondack Phantoms there. So we know the market works. We know it's a great hockey market. And some people have said it's far away from Calgary, but that's what this game's about. I mean, people travel everywhere. And yeah, it's far from Calgary, but if we're on the road, it's not going to be too far away. Yeah, and realistically, how often does that come up where it's an issue where you can't get a guy to your city pronto when it, you know, when you need them? Like, usually the next day they'll be there, so what's the difference? It's only a three-hour flight. Another interesting piece of news from the AHL front that was just announced today as we record this on June 7th is that the Flames have not renewed the contract of Troy Ward, who is the head coach of the Ab- of the Abbotsford Heat for the last couple of years. And I find this kind of puzzling. We don't. I think there's another shoe to drop here. But I always thought Ward was a great developmental coach, and I wanted to see him in the system for a number of years to come, as long as he'd stay here. Yeah, it's one of those things that AHL coaches frequently become AH- or NHL coaches or assistants, so he might be getting a job upwards. Who knows? You know, it, it's disappointing, but... You know, there are a whole host of coaches out there, so, you know, just have to wait and see. The last time that happened with the Flames uh, was with Jim Playfair. He was a well-known AHL coach for the Flames, got promoted to the NHL, as we know, in a head coaching job here, and is now an associate coach, I believe, in Phoenix. So, yeah, it happens all the time. That's how turnover works. And for Troy's sake, I hope he is getting an NHL shot somewhere. Yeah, and he's put the time in, and he definitely did a good job and was a very hard worker in Abbotsford. So, you know, I'm hoping that he gets some sort of NHL job because he has earned it, in my opinion. What do you think the chance would be of him ending up as the as the next Canucks head coach? I could see it, you know, because there are not too many NHL coaches that are good on the market at the moment like i heard that like mark crawford was interviewed i think oh really so, yeah so like you know plus with ward being in the vancouver area already it you know it it would make some sense i think too vancouver's realizing they need to get young and i don't think they want to go through a full rebuild so maybe their thought there could be that by bringing in a guy like troy ward they could kickstart some of that development they need without totally blowing up their team yeah and the canucks do have a few good pieces on their in their system so from schrader to jensen to gaunts and a few others so you know it it they got a ways to go but you know they definitely do need to get yeah they definitely need to go get younger because the sedines a are a little too far past their prime and and unless they want to stick it out for four years and you know then rebuild like we did with (laughs) what happened last year you know 
I wouldn't mind, but... <laughs> yeah, well, I think they can probably see what happened with Calgary. They can see what's happened with Edmonton. And it probably gives Vancouver more, I guess, of an educated look at, okay, these are two teams that have done it, and whose do we want to be more like, or do we want to blaze our own trail? Yeah. And do well, it especially with you know, guys like Kessler, Edler, and the Sedins, like, you can get a King's Ransom right now, whereas if you let them get a little further past the expiration date, then, you know, you're going to get diminished returns. Because I'm sure with Kessler, you could probably get quite a substantive return. So, you know, it just depends. Yeah, well, I would not be surprised to see Kessler moved either at the draft or shortly after July 1 as teams realized they weren't able to get the guy they wanted. Enough of Vancouver. (laughs) Well, why don't we uh, shift our focus then to the Flames' head office? In our last episode, we talked about the new Flames GM, Brad Treliving, who is hired. And it seems like the Flames' hiring of Treliving sparked this whole rash and mess of GMs and coaches losing their job around the league. And I just want us to reflect on now that we've seen GMs who've become available since then, do we still think the Flames got the right guy? I mean, a lot of people, uh, when it came out, and we posed the question through the Twitter uh, page for the show, some people said if they wish the Flames would have waited, and then they could have got Ray Shiro, for example. What are your thoughts there? Do you think that Treliving's still the right guy, or do you think that there's somebody else that we could or could have or should have got that's been released since? I always tend to prefer going with someone new if you have someone like Burke in the background, because you it's not a known quantity. Whereas like with Shiro or Rutherford or you know any of the other potential guys like you know what you're getting so you know it i'd rather go with the new guy just because he might be a really good one and at least you have brian burke in the background so and you know he's good so you know it it lessens the possibility of the gm being a disaster like, if Burke wasn't there and we hired Treliving, then I would be very, very skeptical of the whole scenario. But, you know, it's all good, in my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think if we were to have come out and said, okay, here's our new GM. He has no GM experience of any kind, um, and he's going to lead us out of this rebuild. I would have said, well, yeah, we should have waited for a Ray Shiro or a Jim Rutherford or somebody like that who got released. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I think that, I think they could do it either way. I think that they made the right move by bringing in Treliving under kind of Brian Burke. I still stand behind that move as the right move, but if they would have brought in say Ray Shiro and then a bunch of AGMs and said, look, these AGMs now have two of the best minds in hockey potentially to learn from, and we're grooming them to be the next GM. I could kind of see that too, but no, I don't yeah. think the Flames made the wrong move at all. I, I'm perfectly happy with the move they made, and I wouldn't take it back or try to, you know, wish we got somebody else at all. Yeah, it, you could go either way, but, you know, it either would be good, so there's not really too much of a downside either way. No, so. I guess I'm not looking at it now, at all the GMs that got released and gone, oh, crap, we should have waited a week. Like, I think the Flames have a perfectly capable guy in there. Yeah, exactly, so... You know, just have to wait and see on how things progress from here on forward. And with um, the Flames having their GM in Brad Treliving, he's now also filled out his head office, his hockey operations office. And the Flames have announced their AGM. I think we were probably all surprised. We don't have one assistant general manager. We have three assistant general managers. Um, They are... A guy who's been promoted from within, which is Mike Holditch, who's been with the team since 94. Uh, Craig Conroy got promoted from within. And Brad Pascal, who has served as the Vice President of Hockey Operations with Hockey Canada since 2010, but has really been doing all sorts of various jobs at a high level since 1998 with Hockey Canada, was also brought in. Any surprise to you that Connie got the nod and got promoted? Not at all. I To me, I thought, you know, you can't go forward with Conroy and promote a new AGM and not promote Conroy. I think there'd be optically be an issue there. Yeah, exactly. And especially with Conroy being a fan favorite, it'd be like, you know, you might as well just fire the guy 
if you're yeah. going to go that route. The only way I could have seen them do it would be to name Conroy as like the general manager for the uh, AHL team or something like that. So he's still got a big role, but not with the Calgary Flames. Yeah, but then again, that would be a waste of him. <laughs> so Maybe. Depends how you look at it. Well, Conroy is a good intermediary personality-wise, and he's so well-liked by the team that he'd be a little bit wasted in the middle of nowhere in New York. So Yeah, you could also say, though, that Conroy could be the face that the Adirondack team needs to establish their presence there. True. A nice outgoing GM, a guy who'd be you know good with the kids, and he's going to serve essentially in that role with the Flames going forward as an AGM. But that's the only other way that you could have transitioned him if you didn't want him as AGM. So let's talk a little bit about each of these three guys. Uh, Mike Holditch has been with the team for a while. He's held the dual role of Vice President of Hockey Administration, whatever that means, and Chief Financial Officer with the club. Holditch is pretty much the legal and financial guy. He works closely with the GM and uh, the Director of Hockey Administration, Mike Burke, on... And he's pretty much in charge of CBA interpretation, administration and tracking of player budget, player negotiations, arbitration, scheduling and contract review, and documentation. So he's going to be the guy behind the scenes. We're probably never going to hear from him in front of a camera. And he's pretty much the day-to-day money guy for this team. Yeah, the accountant, more or less. Yeah, and... And he's been with the team forever. He's doing a good job. I mean, there's no point not to bring him up. And I think it makes perfect sense to have an AGM just in charge of contracts and stuff. Conroy will probably, though it hasn't been officially announced, uh, will probably serve in the same role he has been for the last couple of years of really being, I would say, the head of player development. He's the guy who will be going out looking at new players, looking at young players. He'll probably be taking the role of the GM in, in Adirondack. And really being the eyes and the ears, I think, for Burke and uh, Trill Living when they want to look at a young player or get advice on players in our system, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I think Conroy will basically be the rover of the three GMs or assistant general managers in that, like, he'll be having his fingers in, like, 18 different pies all at the same time, just, you know, doing all sorts of different things. I also think of the three AGMs, Conroy will be the one that we will hear from the most. Probably. I think, like you said, he's loved here. He loves to talk. He, you know, the media likes him. So I think if we ever hear from the GM, the AGMs, it'll be him. Mm. And the last AGM, the one who's new to our team, is Brad Pascal. So a second Brad in, in the head office. Um, we have Mike Burke. So we have two Burkeys. Now we have two Brads. So it makes Conroy's job easy. He's just got to know, is he talking to a Berkey or a Brad? Um, He's served with Hockey Canada for 18 years. He's done everything from uh, director of communications to the director of men's national teams, uh, VP of hockey operations. So this is a guy who's well-traveled and really understands, I think, what it takes to run a good hockey program. I mean, you can't deny Hockey Canada runs great hockey programs at every level, from U20 all the way up to World Cup, Olympics, um, everything like that. So I think it's I think it's going to be a great guy to bring in here. Uh, probably sad that Hockey Canada is losing him, but I think he's going to be very versatile in terms of what he can bring to the front office. Yeah, and you know it, he'll likely be the same kind of thing with like he was with uh, Team Canada, where he's just going to be more or less in charge of the day to day player moves and all that kind of stuff i'm assuming because i don't there's not really been any release on no is exact what he's gonna do so i'm assuming it'll be something along those lines now i don't know how front offices are scheduled or or set up or anything like that but i could almost see brad pascal being the guy who stays in calgary um, when the team goes on most road trips to run the front office while everyone else follows the team around. Again, I don't know how that works, but to me that would be a, a role you'd want as someone who kind of, you know, works with the team in Calgary the majority of the time. Mm-hmm. Running things around yeah. here. Yeah, I can see that. So, wh- what do you think about the Flames having three people in that role? The more the merrier. You know, you need to have... 
people that can focus in on just one thing. Because if you got one guy trying to do, like, all three of those jobs, like, you know, you, you can only do so much work in a day. Like, you know, so if you have three people targeting each different part, then more work will get done and you'll get better results that way. Many hands makes, like, light work. And I think, like you said, you can target each guy's strength as to what they're going to do in the organization. Exactly. It's all good. And to... To me, the more hockey minds you have around a table, I mean, if you've got Brian Burke, Brad Treliving, Craig Conroy, Brad Pascal, and Mike Holditch all sitting around a table with, let's say, uh, Todd Button, the head of scouting, all assessing a player or a potential trade or something, you have a lot more opinions floating around and a better pool of knowledge to make your decision based on. Yeah, and the more that you have qualified, intelligent people, you know, giving their honest opinions and all that, you know, it'll do nothing but foster the best results because having multiple people with different concepts, you might get good ideas out of, you know, just group think. So it's all good. Well, Matt, with uh, that little bit of, I guess, Flames news out of the way, should we jump right into the first round? Sure. So the Flames hold the fourth overall pick this year in 2014, the highest pick that the organization has ever held. Before this, the highest was number six. And it looks like a good year for uh, the first round, at least to be early in the first round. The last couple years, it's always seemed like there was one, maybe two players the teams were fighting over at the top. This year, I think there's five or six, depending on how you look at it, top players here. So being in the number four slot, we have a great opportunity to get a good player. Um, why don't we profile some of the players that will be available there, talk a little bit about them, and then we can give our feedback. Yeah, this draft's a little bit weird. Normally you have, like as you were saying, like a clear cut, this is the guy, like McKinnon Or the Taylor Tyler scenario. Yeah, exactly. But this draft's weird in that, like, once you, even once you get past, like, the top 10, 12 people, beyond that, like... There's a wide chunk of players that are you could see any of them go anywhere in that whole range. Like it, it there's no like from like fifteen to twenty five. Like those are like the next tier. Like it's like from fifteen to fifty, and they're all more or less interchangeable. So it's a bit weird. Over this show and the next couple shows, um, we plan to break down each one of the Calgary Flames picks that they have as of the time we record this, June 7th, and talk about the players that are ranked around there, give you a bit of information about them, and then talk about who we think the Flames should or will pick with that uh, that pick. So hopefully this will give Flames fans a better understanding of who's available, what the pick is, and who we might take there. So, so let's start with the number four pick. Um, why don't we start with the guy that Central Scouting is ranked number one uh, among North American skaters, which is centerman Sam Bennett from Kingston in the OHL. He's a six-foot centerman, 178 pounds. Um, his stats this year, he had 35 goals, 55 assists for 91 total points. According to him in an interview with Mike Zeisberger of The Sun, he says his strengths are, quote, my compete level. I think I'm a complete two-way player who plays hard on both ends of the ice. My dad's favorite player was Doug Gilmore, who took pride in playing that style. End quote. What are your thoughts on Sam Bennett? Uh, personally, I think Sam Bennett has the most raw talent of any of the players in the draft this year. He has a really good slap shot, very good passing ability. He's very dynamic offensively. He's... If there's going to be a player from this draft that would score 90 points in the NHL, that's the guy who I think would do it. You know, he does have some flaws, like, you know, he's short, but, you know, the, the, you can't go wrong. Well, and Sam Bennett is, has a, said that too in an interview. He said that he understands he needs to get bigger and stronger, so he knows that that's a big flaw. Yeah, and stylistically he's somewhat similar to Matt Duchesne from Colorado 
just a flashy dynamic. He's not as fast as Duchesne, but stylistically, they're very similar in their approach. So, you know, and if you can get somebody that's that good, then, you know, that'd be awesome. So, Well, that's an interesting question. Do you think the Flames will be able to get somebody that good? Do you think Sam Bennett will be available in number four? You know, it's one of those things that, you know, Buffalo doesn't need the defensemen, so, you know, they're not going to take Ekblad. The Panthers, they need a defenseman, so they're likely going to. The wild card in this situation is really Buffalo and Edmonton, because you got to figure that Buffalo's going to take one of the Sams, and, you know, what Edmonton does, who knows. <laughs> They may end up picking off the board. Who knows? Nick Ritchie to Edmonton, please. <laughs> Edmonton needs defense, too, but I don't think Ekblad is going to be available when they get to the podium. No. Like, it would be a no-brainer for them if Ekblad is on the board that they would be running up to the podium saying, we want Ekblad. So, yeah, and if they don't yeah. take Ekblad and he's available, that's a horrible mistake by the Oilers. But they tend to make those, so who knows? So you think so you think Bennett will be gone? It's one of those things. It really depends on what Edmonton does. Because if you're looking at like what should happen, Ekblad, Bennett, and Reinhardt should go one, two, three in some order. But you know Edmonton, they do like Dre Sadel. I don't know. Like if they pick him, then we're gonna get likely Bennett or Reinhardt, whomever Buffalo didn't take. But there's also the added thing of uh, teams from five below trying to trade up as well. Because uh, the Panthers have expressed interest in trading down because they really like Nick Ehlers and uh, Nylander. So, you know... They... And sometimes you do see crazy things too. Like last year, Seth Jones, who was expected to go fourth, didn't, or expected to go second, didn't go to fourth. So you might see yeah, somebody exactly. do something like, that we're not expecting. You know, there Edmonton either. could take Nick Ritchie. Please take Nick Ritchie. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that too. That would work. <laughs> or Hayden Flurry. He's a defenseman. So, yeah, I think that it's hard to speculate who the Flames will take. Um, So we'll just kind of assume that one of these five guys will go. The number two guy in the list who's ranked second among North American skaters is the 6'3", 218-pound defenseman, Aaron Ekblad. Um, He had 53 points this year with Barry of the OHL. And according to the same interview with Zeisberger, he says his strengths are, quote, I think I'm ready to step into the NHL right away. I think I'm ready on and off the ice. I think I'm confident in my abilities, both offensively and defensively. And when it comes to dealing with the media, I've been doing it since I've been 15, end quote. I really like Aaron Ekblad, but like you said, I don't see him being available when the Flames get to the podium. Yeah. If he was, I'd say take him. But I don't think he's going to be there. His slap shot is good, but like he's not Shea Weber. And defensively he has all the tools necessary it's just how will he adapt from being a man playing against kids to a man playing against men and you know like we saw with Eric Johnson he had a hard time translating until just this past season even though he was drafted the same year as Taze was so you know it it's a wait and see. I I think his floor is like a number three defenseman. And, you know, he's more likely going to be a top pairing guy. It's just how far up in terms of, like, overall talent does he go? I don't know. So, you know, like, if he had Shea Weber's slap shot, then you're looking at a possible, you know, like, top five defenseman in the league so you know but he doesn't quite have that good of a shot i kind of like the idea of having the flames having you know monahan as kind of the face of the forwards during the rebuild and ekblad being the face of the blue line during the rebuild and having those two key young players there yeah it's unfortunate that you know we're picking fourth and edmonton and florida who both need defensemen badly are ahead of us yeah, but, you know, and, and I think that even if the Flames had the chance to pick Ekblad fourth, 
it makes you wonder if, for the number of teams that might want him, if there'd be a better deal to be made trading down to someone else could get him too. And those are all questions that we won't get into. We don't know. But yeah, I think he's one of the prized gems in this draft. So I would be very surprised if we were able to get him. Yeah. Well, you know, we have a pretty poor uh, consolation prize of getting a likely first-line center out of the deal. So, you know, yeah, darn, you know. Watch it. There's... <laughs> But that's the thing. I mean, if if you could... Either way, we're going to get a great forward out of this. And even if we did move the pick, if somebody wanted Ekblad that bad, yeah, you're going to get a good price for him anyways. So it's... Yeah, I I personally think I'd love to see Ekblad here, but I realistically don't see him in a flaming sea. Do you agree? I would be highly, you know, like 5% chance of that happening. And that 5% would be if we traded up to get him. And for that, I would be worried at what the cost would be yeah, to do so. Yeah, it'd be astronomical. <laughs> I don't know if he'd be worth... Yeah, and I don't know if he'd be worth getting at that kind of yeah. cost. I mean, the cost would probably be like a backland Brody and switch the first. And at that point, I don't think it's yeah. worth it. Well, even if it was just backland, that'd be too much. So Well, another guy that potentially could be here, and I think has a better chance of wearing a flaming C than Ekblad is centerman Sam Reinhardt of Kootenai of the WHL. He's ranked number three among North American skaters. Six foot one, 186 pounds. Uh, this year he had 35 goals, 50 assists for 85 total points. And he says his strengths are, quote, My hockey sense is what I feel to be my advantage. Everything else I can work on. I feel that when I practice with the Canadian national team in Switzerland, I could keep up with the pace. That gave me confidence, end quote. The other intri- intriguing thing about Reinhardt is we already have a Reinhardt in our system. So, you know, we could collect them all, yeah. if you will. Um, it could be interesting to have the two brothers there. What do you think about our chances of snagging Reinhardt? Well, Reinhardt is more or less the same type of guy that Sean Monaghan is, with one exception. Uh, Monaghan is more of a shoot-first guy, where... Reinhardt's more of a pass first guy, but like all the rest of their game is more or less the same. They're both very cerebral thinkers on the ice. So that's what you're you're basically getting another Monahan that's slightly different if we get him. Honestly, I would be shocked if and I would be jumping up and down for joy if he was on the board at number four. I think Buffalo would take him because they really do need someone like that in their system because they don't really have any forwards that are any good. So, yeah, I I think that he'll end up going early before we can get to him. But if he was available at fourth, I think unless Ekblad's also on the board, you probably take Sam Reinhardt. Yeah. Like I only, even if uh, Edmonton really likes Dre Sadel, I think if Reinhardt's on the board, I think they would take him even though they might really like Dre Sadel. So, who knows? Watching the video that you posted on our website of Reinhardt and other footage I've seen of him and the one time I saw him here in Calgary this year uh, in person, I agree with you that he looks a lot like Monaghan, and I think that you might find that if he were to join the Flames organization, they might try to transition him to be a winger. I think that he has more of a playmaking style than Monaghan does, and the two might complement each other very well. Yeah, Somewhat Tanga-esque in his passing ability, where he can just find people through a maze. So, you know, he's probably the best passer in the draft in its entirety, and he's by far the smartest player in the draft for how he thinks the game. So, you know... I would not be displeased if we got him in the slightest. I that's him and Bennett are my like number one and one A, so on my list. So instead of Taylor Tyler for you this year, it's Sam and yeah. Sam. If we could get either of the Sams, I would be thrilled. The ho- in my opinion, the pick would be a home run, grand slam, game seven of the World Series to win the championship. So. Uh, Next guy in line, another WHL player, the first non-North American-born skater on our list, though he's played in North America, so he's ranked number four among North American skaters. This is uh, Leon Dreisaitl. 
He's a centerman. Um, he played last year for Prince Albert, and he's from Cologne, Germany. His stats last year were 36 goals, 67 assists for 105 points overall. His strengths are, quote, I'm a playmaker who's good at protecting the puck. I'm strong for my age, so I think I've gotten better at shielding it from opposing, opposing defensemen, end quote. Leon Dreisaitl is a guy that, according to a lot of the experts I've seen in the mock drafts, um, a lot of them think that Dreisaitl will be pay- taken by the Flames. What do you think about Dreisaitl, and would you like to see him as a flame in a, as a flame next year? Well, it's one of those things that, like, say the Sams and Ekblad are gone when we go to pick, and Dreisaitl's there, and we take him. I'm not going to be disappointed there either. You know, you got a guy that's six two, two thirty, and his, the one area that he was weak in from the viewings that I had of him was that he was slow, but at the World Championships, I got to see him again, and, like, the speed issue was extremely overblown. He was moving a lot quicker. He's not quick, but, you know, at least average NHL speed. And he did have four points in that tournament, which was the highest for someone like, tied for the highest for someone that was that young uh, with Evgeny Malkin. So, you know, you're getting somebody that is pretty good. So, you know, you're basically getting a guy that's more or less like an Anze Kopitar-esque guy. So, you know, you can't really complain too much. You know, if you're not going to get Monaghan 2.0 or a Matt Duchesne clone, you know, getting someone like Kopitar, you know, you're really hard done by there. And if you look at what Kopitar did for the Kings in the playoffs so far, um, I think anyone would say that if you can get another Kopitar, that'd be a great pick. Yeah, like, you, you're you really hard done by, like, you know, gee, darn, we got, a, you know, somebody that could be a all-star first-line center. Why would you want that, man? You know, exactly. Come on now, fire those scouts. The issue I've had with Dre Sadlin, I'll be honest, I haven't seen him play in person this year, but I've seen him uh, in the past. I always thought he was a little bit one-dimensional, and that's the worry that I would have with bringing him in. He didn't seem like he had the, the full game figured out, and the defensive side always seemed to be lacking there. Yeah, I can see that. And, you know, he's pro- of the top four guys, he's probably the most incomplete in that regard. But, you know, you also need guys who can put the puck in the net. So, you know, you can teach him how to play a two-way game. He's not completely inept in his own end. He's just not, that's not his strength. So, yeah, it's one of those things. You'd actually have to work with him to improve that. So, you know, the other guys, you don't really need to. (laughs) Not, Not to the same extent anyway. And again, Dre Sadel's another guy who I think if the Flames were to bring him in because he is more of a playmaker, you might see him converted to a winger here. Yeah. Well, plus Burke said he has a big ass, so, you know, that there's a vote of confidence for you. There you go. Maybe we can get <laughs> Sir Mix-a-Lot to sponsor him. The last player on our list here is the only one that is a natural winger, uh, the number five ranked North American s- player by Central Scouting, and that's Michael Del Colley of Oshawa of the OHL. He's 6'2", 182 pounds, uh, from Vaughan, Ontario. His stats for this past season, 39 goals, 56 assists for 95 total points. And his strengths are, quote, I think my overall offensive skill set. I think the upside with me is pretty high. I think if I stay the course, I can be a top six forward in the NHL one day. End quote. So it sounds like son his agent probably gave him for that interview. Um... We're in. We're into the point where we're at the number five forward here with Del Colley of North America. Do you think that the Flames, if all the other guys were taken or some of them were taken, do you think Del Colley would be next on the list, or would you start looking at the European skaters? I like Del Colley. I think he's like for just raw offensive skill. I think he's actually the second best player in the draft, and you're likely going to get a first line winger out of him. Because he does have a really dynamite shot and good passing ability. But, you know, he is a winger. And when you have three first-line centers, potentially, 
you know, a winger is not nearly as valuable. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that we're likely going to get one of the top four guys. But, you know, if you got Dalkali, you couldn't really complain too much because you're getting someone that is really talented. So, so just as a hypothetical, let's say the Flames were to talk to other GMs, uh, know that, say, Sam, 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 and Aaron were taken... Um, and there is another team in the top, say, seven or eight, that wanted to trade up. Do you think it would, because they wanted to take a North American skater like uh, Michael Nylander or Kapanen, uh, do you think that if the Flames were to trade down to, say, sixth or seventh and still be able to get Del Colley, we could call this a successful first round? Yeah. Uh, it's not just Del Colley, though. Like, there's a couple of other guys, Nylander and Ellers, who are both fantastic as well. So, you know, it's when you start getting past that where you're getting into the Nick Ritchie, Hayden Fleury era range that it's, you know, not... They're, the talent's not quite as good. I find it interesting so. that the five North American skaters this year are pretty much ranked by by most people as being the top five guys to go. And most people think that the European skaters will go after them shortly. Yeah. They're good players. It's just they're not quite as good. So to me, I think any of the five that we just talked about, Sam Bennett, Aaron Ekblad, Sam Reinhardt, Leon Dreisaitl, Michael Del Colley, I think any of those would be a great pick for the Flames. I think the Flame fans would be happy with any of those guys coming to our team. Um, like you said, I think Del Colley and Bennett have the most potential upside. I don't think we necessarily have to have a first-line center this year. I think if you look at the rebuild going forward, we have um, already Sean Monahan who's going to play that role. But as far as, you know, who you would like in your gut, not necessarily thinking about other teams and who they might take, but if in your gut, if you had to pick one of these guys, who would it be to be the Flames pick? Number one on my list would be Sam Bennett. Number two on my list would be Sam Reinhart. Number three would really? be Del Colley. Okay. That's about how I've seen a lot of people rate them. I think I'm I'm pretty much the same as you. Um, mine's slightly different. I think I go Sam Bennett, Aaron Ekblad than Sam Reinhardt. I like Ekblad, and I, I think the Flames could really use a, a good young defenseman there. I'm always leery of taking defensemen in the top five just because they're typically a little bit riskier than forwards, and that's, you know, I'm just going on odds that, you know, you're less likely to get somebody that flames out. But I mean, you know, so. at the same time, somebody's got to take them, right? Oh, yeah. I'm not arguing. It's just... Yeah, you know, I'm always a little leery with defensemen, so it's like taking goalies in the first round. It's just a little yeah, could be used better elsewhere. We asked our fans through Facebook and Twitter this week, and those who subscribe to our website, what they thought, who they thought the Flames should take, or who they want the Flames to take. And there's a poll up on FiresideChat.ca where we've asked people who they thought the Flames should take. Uh, so let's go through those results. You and I both think that Sam Sam Bennett is probably the best player in the draft, but we both agree he'll probably be gone. High likelihood he'll be gone before the Flames get to him. And he came in second on our list of people to, that the fans would like to see the Flames take with 27% of the vote. I personally think he didn't get as many votes because everyone knows he's going to be gone before we can get to him. Um... Mm -hmm. Next on the list is Aaron Ekblad, and he got 0% of the votes. Again, I think everyone probably realizes not that they don't want him here, but simply that he'll be gone before we can get to him. Yeah. Well, you you look at Florida, and like they have Kulikov and Good Branson, and then that's it for their good defensive prospects. So like yeah. they're really needing a good defenseman. And then right after that, you got Edmonton, who... Give me a break. They need help back if, there. If he so. were to fall to fourth, I think that somebody would have really screwed up. Edmonton would have to fire somebody. Right as he walks yeah, off the podium. Well, that's it. Yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't end up firing McTavish, but you should. Right as he walks off the podium, he should be fired. And the player that got the most votes, 36% of the votes in our in our poll on FiresideChat.ca, is Sam Reinhardt. Uh, most people think that Sam Reinhardt's who they'd like to, the Flames to pick, and 
I think that Sam Reinhardt is very possible that he could fall to fourth, uh, depending on what other teams do there. Yeah, it's a real toss-up, because, you know, the one saving grace for uh, the Flames is that Edmonton has too many small forwards, and both Reinhardt and Bennett are thin and are not likely going to be in the NHL next year. They Reinhardt might, Bennett's doubtful. So, you know, when you have that compared to Dre Sadel, who's 6'2", 230, you know, and they're more or less in the same group, I'm hoping they go Dre Sadel just to, you know, but who knows. And then, as you mentioned, Dre Sadel. Uh, Dre Sadel and Del Colley tied on our votes for 18%. And I think it is more likely that either Dre Sadler or Del Colley will be taken. And I think that if you're picking between Dre Sadler, Del Colley, and let's say some of the European forwards like uh, Kapanen, Nylander, you'd probably end up taking Dre Sadler there. Just because of the physical size there, you know, you can't com- complain too much. You know, much, I know it's kind of a weird so. thing to look at, but and maybe this is why no one's ever called me to be a professional scout, but I think the fact that Dre Sadler's from Germany could help his uh, development down the road because you know every year he's going to get called by the German national team if they are ever in any sort of international tournament. And I think that playing at that level against some of the big teams could really help his development there. Well, you you see the same thing with Slovenia, with Kopitar. Like, uh, their national program has grown leaps and bounds just because of Kopitar. So, you know, it's good. And... You know, hopefully, it, you know, he, if we do pick him, that he does succeed enough where he's going to be tabbed regularly well, I think and all e- that. Even fun. if he doesn't succeed so. regularly, he's probably the best that Germany's got right now. I don't know who else is on that roster, but I think even if he were to, you know, bust and play in the German Elite League or something, he's always going to be on that team. I think the last guy worth writing home about that played for Germany was Ulf Kolzig. Marco Sturm. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what Germany's program's like or what tournaments they actually qualify for, but that could be a place that you could see them uh, going forward and saying, okay, you know, if we do take this guy, I wouldn't take him because of that, but if we do take this guy, we know that he's going to have some opportunities that other guys might not to play against some of the best talents in the world. Yeah, it's just an added bonus. Exactly. So you're you're thinking the Flames with fourth overall are gonna take who? I would whichever Sam is left on the board if there is one, and if not, then it would be Dre Sadel. So realistically, probably Dre Sadel. Yeah, it'll be one of the three forwards. It it's just it's so hard to gauge exactly what Buffalo and Edmonton are gonna do because. Like, Buffalo, they have no centers other than Hodgson that are any good, and Edmonton, they need big forwards, but they also need a good, you know, it it just depends, really. You, we won't know definitively until the names are called, because, you know, there's, it, you have three guys that are playing the same position, and they all have, it, it, like, completely different games and how they approach it. So, you know, which flavor does Buffalo like? Which flavor does Edmonton like? You don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. And we'll just get left with the leftovers, and hopefully ours is the best. So, Well, I, th- I think that the Flames can't go wrong. I mean, as long as they're picking no. one, of the, one of the five guys we've talked about, you can't go wrong with any of these players. Some of them might have a different temperament. Some of them might take more training in certain areas. But I think, you know, at fourth overall this year, you're going to get a great player. Yeah. And, like, that's why, like, any of the other guys, like Ellers, Nylander, whatever, Richie, you know, if you're going to go that route, trade down, because the top four, they're clearly better. So, you know, you got a top four pick, keep it and just run with it. I agree I'd keep the top four pick, but I can see this year there being a lot of movement or attempted movement into the top ten by teams that might be later. I think we have the most dynamic group of top ten players that we've had in a number of years. 
So I can see a lot of teams trying to move into that top 10 to grab some of those other guys. Yeah, most definitely. And I think it'll make draft day interesting to watch for sure. Well, let's wrap up this episode, Matt. Uh, next episode, we'll be back, and we will be talking about the the rest of the Flames picks, the rest of the Flames high picks, I should say. They're going to be quite busy. They have two picks in the second round and two picks in the third round, and we'll profile those, and we're back. Have a good one, everyone. See you guys soon, and come back for the next episode in our draft preview. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.